All right, good evening. I'd like to call the November 9th, 2023 meeting of the Greenville City Council to order. I'm Mayor P.J. Connolly, and I'll be presiding over the meeting. I guess I'm going to call on myself for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you just join me for a moment of silence. Thank, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Mayor Connolly? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Glover? Here. Council Member Daniels? Present. Council Member Blackburn? Present. Council Member Smiley? Here. Council Member mm -hmm. Robinson? Here. Council Member Bell? Here. All right, Mayor Connolly, have a quorum. Thank you very much. Now, this is going to be really strange. I usually say Madam Manager, but tonight I'm going to say, do I say Mr. Manager? That sounds good. Mr. Manager, do um, you have any recommended changes for the approval of tonight's agenda? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I received a request from the applicant for public hearing item number 11, ordinance requested by Marin Sport Motor Works, LLC, to amend Title IX, Chapter 4, Section 86G, Fraternity or Sorority, to withdraw and remove this item from consideration tonight. So therefore, I request council remove this item from the agenda. So moved. Second. I, can we just move to approve the whole thing? Sure, as amended. Yeah. Do you need a... Do you so need moved. A, do you need a closed session? Yeah, also add a closed session. Yeah. Move to approve as amended. There you go, you do it, I'm sorry. I did. Thank move you. to Second. approve as amended. Second. Monica had already seconded. Okay. Well, you got to work. What, what you got to work. Seven? All right, so we did just for clarification session. purposes, the motion is to remove item number 11 and also to add a closed session to this meeting. Correct. Besides just removal, it's the council agrees that the petition is withdrawn and removed. There you go. Yeah. And so that was motion was made by Councilmember Blackburn, second by Councilmember Daniels. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Everybody understand? Yep. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to special recognitions. No. <laughs> One of the honors of being a city manager is to be able to recognize uh, employees for their years of the service and everything that they have given back to, uh, to our community as employees of this city. And I'd like to call forward right now Calvin Burney with the Public Works Department here tonight. Mr. Bernie, your, your department thinks a lot of you. I got a lot of special words to kind of describe the type of person uh, that you know, your department believes that you are. So Calvin first started with the city in November of 1999 as a seasonal leaf collector with our solid waste division. He worked in that role for nine years and then worked for Browning Wood for another 14 years. Calvin returned to the city and public works in March of 2017 as a grounds maintenance worker. He stayed in this role until his retirement on November 1st of this year. Calvin played an important role in keeping our city looking beautiful, and you did an outstanding job of that, let me tell you. He handled all beautification requests submitted from our residents, as well as addressing his standard beautification routes on a daily basis. Calvin is a very outgoing, friendly person. Citizens um, knew his route, and they would stop him to inform him that he was doing a great job. If he finished his route early, he would assist the right-of-way crew in their beautification efforts around the city. Now, here we go. Calvin was very dependable 
and all was always willing to expand on the tasks requested of him. He assisted many times with cemetery personnel and provided great services, leading processions to the cemetery. His one condition to supervisors is make sure I get out before dark. I love that. <laughs> On his days off, he would often cook for his fellow crews. Listen to this. He would bring in rutabagas, fried lacy cornbread, oxtails, and dried butter beans as he loved the fellowship with his co-workers. Calvin Burney will be missed for his work ethic, great meals he provided, his bright smile, and joyful demeanor. And let me just say, when you have those words that are spoken to you, at retirement, that means that you are really loved by your department, and I just so thank you for everything that you have done on behalf of the city. Thank you. On to the public comment period. Public comment period is a period reserved for comments by the public. Items that were or are scheduled to be the subject of a public hearing conducted at this same meeting or another meeting during the same week shall not be discussed. A total of 30 minutes is allocated with each individual being allowed no more than three minutes. Indi individuals who register with the city clerk to speak will speak in the order of register until the allotted 30 minutes expires. If time remains after per all persons who have registered have spoken, individuals who do not register will have an opportunity to speak until the allotted 30 minutes expires. Um, and just as a clarification, the number item number 11, I'm sure there's several people that are here today, uh, has been removed from the agenda, so it's no longer uh, an item that we're going to discuss. So just a reminder. Madam Clerk, All right. our first speaker. Yes, sir. First speaker is Mr. Mari York. Mr. York, you have three minutes to address the mayor and council. <clears throat> I'm Maury York, president of Truna. I would like to speak with you tonight about the six block stretch of East Fifth Street that is the subject of Mr. Woody Witcher's Greek Life Text Amendment, an initiative that has been withdrawn after consuming untold hours of effort on the part of planning staff members and alarmed neighbors over a three month period of false starts. The magnificent oak trees planted years ago by the Brown family made this part of Fifth one of Greenville's most picturesque thoroughfares, a thoroughfare that runs past the front entrance of ECU and provides access to Cypress Glen, Greenville's premier senior living community. The majority of the single family houses in the relevant area are owner occupied, and I have a list to prove it. They are homes, not commodities, to be collected by real estate investors. They are homes where families have raised their children and where some are doing so now. They are homes where friends come over for meals and offer to pick up each other's mail when they are out of town. They are homes where neighbors keep an eye on things when others are away on trips. In short, they are part of a neighborhood. I imagine it is much like the ones you live in, and I doubt you would want fraternities and sororities on your street. Neither do we. Always keep in mind that many dedicated citizens and council members crafted the Horizons 2026 community plan and such zoning classifications as R9S in a deliberate effort to stabilize neighborhoods, including ours. The stretch of Fifth Street in question is part of a larger R9S zone that runs from 10th Street to 4th Street. The withdrawn text amendment would have carved out a small part 
in the middle of this zoning area, a circumstance that a court likely would have disallowed as an egregious example of spot zoning. We respectfully ask that the council enforce current zoning ordinances and adhere to the city's planning documents. Consider adopting a notification procedure so that affected residents will be aware of zoning requests in a timely fashion. Please do not let anyone put us through the ordeal we have endured in recent months. Close this door. Work with ECU to find an appropriate location, possibly the expansive wooded property that the university owns across from the baseball stadium on Charles Street, where fraternities and sororities could be located without disrupting a single family neighborhood. Now I would like to ask all those present who are opposed to the location fraternities and sororities in this or other single family neighborhoods to stand. All right, thank you, Mr. York. Madam Clerk, our next speaker. Yes, our next speaker is Mr. Bill Crew. Mr. Crew, you have three minutes to address the mayor and council. Uh, my name is Bill Crew. I live at 2011 East 5th Street, and I'm in opposition, as uh, Mr. York is, to propose amendment changes, ordinance changes. I uh, have kind of lived uh, the horror that a fraternity house will propose to a neighborhood like this. Uh, in 2017, a house was purchased next to mine on corner. I live on a corner hilltop, a two-story house. It was purchased for the use of a uh, supposedly for his son to come to ECU. Turns out to be it was a, a fraternity house. Um, it was a Kappa Sigma. Uh, they held meetings there. They held parties there. Uh, the ambulance had to come numerous times. Uh, the police had been called numerous times for loud parties, people over a hundred people at parties, uh, drinking um, with uh, no person to check age limits and stuff, um, trash all over the neighborhood and the yards. Traffic uh, was blocked up in uh, both directions from Uber people trying to come at different directions. The police were even having a hard time coming to check the decibel readings. Uh, so. This past Monday, I asked my wife to get a list of the times that they had come to the p property and uh, had problems, and uh, that, that was unfortunately not able to be a, uh, a list given to you, to you today. But it was very numerous times, um, in maybe a uh, year and a half, two years. Since then, I guess the fraternity has had a house over on 10th Street that they take more of their uh, parties over there, and it's calmed down in my neighborhood quite a bit but I see the potential for what the problem could be for our neighborhood. And it kept people awake, it kept neighbors with children uh, awake. Uh, it was the fire department had to come for bonfires. Uh, it's just a disruption to the neighborhood that I don't think that we need. So I thank you for your thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. Madam Clerk, our next speaker. Yes, sir. our next speaker is Mr. Um, Mr. Andrew Moorhead, you've got three minutes to address the mayor and council. Thank you. Um, I'm back. Uh, Dr. Andrew Moorhead, um, 409 South Harding Street. I'm going to sort of touch on two things today. One is, is sort of a more philosophical kind of question, which is um, we had a long conversation about the Historic Preservation Commission when this first came forward, and the commission um, reached a consensus quite easily that this is the antithesis of what we're trying to do in terms of historic preservation of the neighborhood and its character as, as a neighborhood where students and faculty um, and staff have lived all these years. I also want to speak uh, to the sort of the costs around this kind of decision, right? The reason that staff um, did not recommend this is not just it's, con it's a incongruence with the plan, but it, there are also real costs that come with this. And this is not because I'm, I mean, I've worked my entire life and career as students. I'm not against students. I'm not against fraternities and sororities. In fact, I would also say Mr. Richard's been very good to work with the HPC. So this is not a, an antithesis. It's more that antipathy. It's more that there are real costs that come with increasing density and transient um, parts of a neighborhood. 
and we covered a lot of this. When we um, had the four unrelated um, conversation, evidence showed that students are twice, student owned, student occupied property is twice as likely to be victims of crimes. Um, you're talking about more traffic. You're talking about, um, you're talking about increased cost to the city in a um, home that's been now converted to a social organization that is tax free, which means that those costs that come with that conversion fall upon the taxpayers. Um, as does the additional crime that comes with it. So those are, those are very real concerns about any kind of, you know, on-scale conversion in a neighborhood that's already 85% rental and is struggling to be stabilized. And having a mixture of homes that are occupied by homeowners and by students is the right place to be because it helps keep everybody safe, it spreads the costs, and it helps maintain the property values. When I spoke in front of the council about the four unrelated, at that time, being in a neighborhood that was more than 60% um, um, rental occupied resulted in a, in a um, cost, a $5,000 cost um, in value of the homes around it. That was more than a decade ago, so we're talking certainly a larger amount. So again, that's another hit on the tax base. So there are both practical and philosophical reasons that um, I speak to you today in opposition of this conversion. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moorhead. Madam Clerk, our next speaker. Yes, sir. Next speaker is Mr. Jack Robertson. Mr. Robertson, you have three minutes to address the mayor and council. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, address the uh, council. I'm uh, Jack Robertson. I'm the, I live at Cypress Glen. I'm the Cypress Glen representative on the uh, uh, Tar River University Neighborhood Association Truna board. And I, I, uh, I'm here with the uh, executive director of Cypress Glen, Laura Stallings. We want to express our concern about uh, issues like this item 11 for the rezoning request uh, and how that will affect uh, the entire neighborhood that includes Cypress Glen. Uh, we uh, strongly oppose any initiative to uh, do spot zoning in, in that uh, residential neighborhood. That's one of the qualities of the neighborhood that uh, uh, appeals to the people that come to Cypress Glen, who is a strong community uh, group in this uh, city. So I would, uh, Laura Stallings has uh, sent a letter to each of the board members, and I, uh, I was going to read that letter if, if this issue was not taken off the agenda, but. Uh, hopefully uh, you all read that uh, that letter and it expresses our concern we're not against sororities or fraternities of course uh, we think there's a place for them and it's not on fifth street in the residential area so uh, uh, on a personal note i'm appalled at the shameful way this issue even came to the council and to the commission, uh, and I'll close with that. All right, thank you, Mr. Robertson. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, our next speaker. Yes, sir, um, Chris Mansfield, you have three minutes to address the mayor and council. Uh, thank you very much. Um, again, I'm Chris Mansfield, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, from ECU. I've lived in the neighborhood for about 50 years and presently live at 408 South Harding Street. I first want to say that I'm sympathetic to fraternities and sororities. I was the president of mine in college, active on the Interfraternity Council. I really do believe that they can provide opportunities for leadership, scholarship, community service, student opportunities uh, for community engagement, brotherhood and sisterhood. Um, if well supervised, if well supervised, well supervised means 
being named uh, accountable to a national chapter, accountable to the university, uh, supervised by a corporation of alumni that own the house, maintain the house, and monitor the behaviors that go on in the house. But fraternities and sororities can ruin a neighborhood. You all know how and why. I believe it's one of the reasons why the Dale House remains unoccupied. So please don't ruin any more of Fifth Street with a rezoning for fraternities and sororities. It would hurt not only my neighborhood, but it would hurt, it would hurt the city of Greenville when it is challenged in court as a spot zoning. Spot zoning is defined as a small tract surrounded by a larger tract uniformly zoned that threatens the small tract, treats it differently. And courts will likely not allow it particularly if it is acted arbitrarily and capriciously with no reasonable basis, no reasonable public basis for doing so. If the record also shows deceit and misrepresentation by some of the council members, any council member, it would be very difficult to argue that it wasn't arbitrary <clears throat> and capricious. Please <clears throat> take it off and don't bring it up as a rezoning. Turn it in, turn it back to the university to come up with their idea That's of time. what a Greek village would be. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mansfield. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, our next speaker. There are no additional registered speakers. All right. Anyone else would like to speak during the public comment period? Please come forward and state your name for the record. You have three minutes. <clears throat> come Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Anthony King. Um, I just wanted to ask about the uh, public bus system. Um, there's supposed to be, I, I assume there was supposed to be uh, uh, a route to the DMV that was moved to Martin Luther King Highway, but there isn't. The closest stop is about a mile away. So I just wanted to know, was there anything in the works for that or is there anything we could do? Uh, Mr. King, if you could get with uh, a, a Deputy City Manager, Mr. Graves right there, he can help you out in that. I mean, do we know the answer to that question though? Mm -hmm. That we could? I do not know. You don't know? Okay. Okay, would be nice to Public okay. Anyone else would like to speak during the public comment period? Please come forward, state your name for the record. You have three minutes. By the way, thank you, Mr. King, for coming tonight. We appreciate it. All right, seeing none, we'll close the public comment period. And if I may, I just would like to thank everyone who came out tonight to address this issue. And um, you've been heard, and the item has been withdrawn from the agenda. I think we are looking at a period of incredible growth in the sorority and fraternity community. And as was mentioned tonight, the idea of a Greek village. And I think as we look ahead to the future, it's going to be very important for us to work with the university, the city, and the neighborhood to make sure that we have a solution that allows the fraternities and sororities to live their life and to have their social events and to have their meeting places and not worry about trying to squeeze incompatible uses together. So thank you for coming out.
bet they're all going to Chico's right now. That'd be pretty cool. You say it's not really bad? Huh? Important. All right, we'll move on to the consent agenda, Mr. Manager. Oh, appointments. I'm sorry, yep. I'm sorry, appointments. <laughs> Madam Clerk, we'll move on to the appointments. Get a little excited, <laughs> jump into the appointments. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to um, shadow your like time to shine. <clears throat> um, the first board is the Affordable Housing Loan Committee, Council Member Blackburn. That one is still on hold. I'm working to fill that position, okay. thank you. Next is the Human Relations Council, Mayor Pro Tem Glover. Continue. Okay. Um, next is the Police Community Relations Committee, Mayor Pro Tem Glover. Mm -hmm. um, next is the Shepherd Memorial Library Board. I'd like to continue that, please. Okay. And finally, we have got the Youth Council, Mayor Pro Tem Glover. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. Second. Second. All right, motion's been made by Mayor Pro Tem Glover, second by Councilmember Bell. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6-0. Congratulations, Kajai Fu and Rihanna Knight. Next, um, we've got um, two appointments that need to be made to the Mid-East Commission, both for the regular and alternate member. Um, we recommend um, appointing Interim Planning and Development Services uh, Director Les Everett to the regular spot and um, Planner Chris Kelly to the alternate seat. Second. Okay. All right. Motion was made by Mayor, uh, by, uh, no. Council, member, <laughs> Council Member Daniels, second by uh, Council Member Blackburn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. All right, motion passes 6 0. We got Mr. Kelly and who's? Um, Les, Les Everett. Les Mr. Everett. Everett. Yeah. Look at that, the man of the hour. <laughs> right, and that concludes the appointments. All right, now I think we will move on to the consent agenda, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight on the consent agenda, we have item number four, proposed amendment of the Board and Commission's policy of the City of Greenville. Item number five, ordinance adopting Greenville Utility Commission's electric capital project budget and reimbursement resolution for the community solar project. Item number six, ordinance authorizing the execution and delivery of the amendment and restated full requirements power sales agreement between North Carolina Eastern Municipal Power Agency and Duke Energy Progress, LLC. Item number seven, a request by the police department to utilize asset forfeiture funds <coughs> to purchase equipment and software. And item number eight, various tax refunds greater than $100. Motion to approve the consent agenda. You are too fast. You are too fast. Councilmember Robinson. I know a colleague. I know a colleague that likes to pull something from the consent agenda. <laughs> And, and as a matter of fact, I would like to pull an item from the consent agenda. Um, I'd like to pull, please, item number five from the consent agenda. Motion to approve consent agenda absent item number five. Second. All right, motion has been made by Councilmember Robinson, second by Councilmember Smiley. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. We'll move on to item number five. Mr. Item Manager? Number, item, item number five ordinance adopting Greenville Utility Commission's electric capital project budget and reimbursement resolution for the community solar project. I would call forward GUC General Manager and CEO Tony Cannon. <clears throat> Do you have questions? I do. Um, as you know, solar energy is an issue that has been of great in interest to a lot of people in our community for a number of years, and I know that um, net metering and different ways to price out solar energy when you provide your own energy and then you can sell it back to the grid. Um, so what I'd like is just a little bit of information about what, what this is, the project, <coughs> and a little bit about how that might change or incentivize more use of solar energy. So this is about a half a megawatt solar farm that we would be constructing out near our wastewater treatment plant near Bradford Creek. Uh, it is a subscription project. So it'll be about a half a megawatt. 
we will sell subscriptions to solar panels to interested parties and then they would consume that electricity they would receive a credit for that on their bill what is the rate if you if i wanted to buy solar power which i would love to do will i pay the same rate as other guc customers uh the, the rate is at an avoided cost that you would get a credit for that has been calculated almost that's around 5.9 cents and, and how does that compare with the regular GUC rates? Our regular rates are right around nine cents. I'm sorry, it's what? Nine cents. So I would pay, so there's nine cents as the regular rate, and what would the solar rate be? The credit for the solar rate is at our avoided cost of power, which is around 5.9 cents. So again, just getting to the to sort of, if I wanted to, if I wanted to be a subscriber of the solar energy, um, would I pay the same rate as GUC customers? Yes. So it wouldn't cost me any more, it'd be the same price? No, it's gonna cost you just a little bit more because the credit that you, you actually consume your power, then you receive a credit. So the difference there is about four cents. So let's say my bill is $100 a month and I wanted to be a subscriber to Solar Energy, what would my monthly bill become? I don't know that right off the top of my head. I really didn't expect this item to be pulled and didn't bring that information with me. My guess is somewhere around if your bill's $100 now, you're probably looking at around 100 and, between $102 and $105. Okay, so marginally, that was all I wanted to get at. So only marginal, because mm -hmm. I know that when we've talked about this before, there was an issue of uh, solar energy needing to subsidize solar energy um, and having the solar energy, you know, people who wanted to subscribe actually would be subsidizing the project. And I think my concern is that this is a worthy project for our, for our entire city and um, people shouldn't feel that they had to be penalized or pay more for it. So it sounds like you're saying it's marginally more expensive, but not something that would sort of discourage someone from using it. Correct. And there would be a limit to the number of subscriptions that a person, we, we think it's going to be fully subscribed fairly quickly. So we're going to limit the solar panels that you can purchase to five to start with. And then there are no corporate, this is for residential. So uh, we would have offered to residential customers first, and then if not fully subscribed, then we could offer to commercial. I mean, this is wonderful. We'll have our own solar farm. Now, does this affect in any way the net metering issue and trying to make sure that if I generate my solar power that I can sell it back to the grid at, this, at the same rate that I pay? Has so we, we now offer three different rates for, for consumers that want to put uh, solar panels on either on their homes or place of businesses. Uh, one is net metering, another one is net billing, and then one is a buy-all, sell-all contract. So all in all, it sounds like this is really a good day for, for alternative energy sources and that we're really being progressive by having our own solar farm and also having this progressive way of uh, selling energy back to the grid. Well, this was an option that was asked for uh, when we did our customer survey last year. It's taken a little while to develop it. It'll probably take about 18 months to build it. I could be happier. This is great news. Mr. Cannon, thank you so much. Thank you. And one piece of this that I think is an interesting summary, at least what my understanding was, and you can confirm this, is that the way this is set up is that the full lifetime cost of building and operating the solar farm is being divided into the amount of um, that you know, the number of people who would like to subscribe to it, and then they'll simply receive whatever power it generates. So all of so it's kind of self-contained in that regard right it doesn't it doesn't have an impact on the the power needs or the power cost of the people who are not subscribers to it they, right. a, the subscribers are basically through guc building their own solar farm pay operating it with their by the cost they pay and harvesting whatever the whatever the energy that comes off it is so that's correct if it's successful, do you see it being expanded? Uh, we can't do more than a half megawatt per site with our contract. Uh, we do anticipate Fayetteville did this a couple of years ago. They're in their second project now. So likely if it's fully subscribed and oversubscribed, there will likely be a second project. Thank you. Great news. Um, and with that, I will move to approve this item. Second. second. All right, motion has been made by Councilmember Blackburn, second by Councilmember Smiley. All those in favor say aye. 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 As opposed, say nay. Motion passes 6-0. All right. Thank, Thank you me. very much, Mr. Cannon.
We'll now move on to new business, which is the public hearings. This is the policy of the public hearings adopted by the City Council. The petitioner or representative of the petitioner and a leader of those in opposition will each have 10 minutes. Persons following them will have up to three minutes each, with a total for each side of no more than 30 minutes. Additionally, I want to remind those in attendance to extend the courtesy to persons speaking during the public hearing and to the City Council during discussions. Comments made by members of the public are to occur only during the public hearing is allowed by the mayor in, a, in accordance with the adopted policy of the city council. There should be no interruptions of speakers or council members, including expressions of support or disagreements verbally or by applause, as, as this is distracting and makes discussion difficult. We ask for your cooperation. Thank you. Mr. Manager, please proceed with the first item for the public hearing. Thank you, Mayor. The first public hearing here tonight is item number nine, ordinance to annex Abigail Trails phase two property involving 9.6363 acres located 965 plus or minus feet east of Frog Level Road at the current termini of Abigail Taylor Drive and Sarah Rebecca Drive. Now I'll call forward uh, City Planner 1, Chris Kelly. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. This property is located in the southwestern quadrant of the city limits. More specifically, the property is located 965 feet east of Frog Level Road at the current termini of Abigail Taylor Drive and Sarah Rebecca Drive. This property is located in the Swift Creek watershed and if stormwater rules apply, will require 25 year detention. The property is also located in the primary service area on the Tears Growth map and is located in city council voting district number two. The property is anticipated to yield 35 two-family lots with an estimated tax value of $12,255,000. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions for Mr. Kelly? All right. Seeing none, thank you very much. Public hearing is now open. Those who speak on behalf of the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. See none. Those in opposition to the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. Open for a board discussion or a motion. Move to approve. Second. All right, motion has been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Robinson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. All right, we'll move on to item number 10, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mayor. The second public hearing here tonight is item number 10, ordinance requested by Blue Max Rentals LLC to rezone 0.43 acres located along the southern right of way of Southwest Greenville Boulevard, 520 plus or minus feet west of Front Gate Drive from OR, Office Residential High Density Multifamily to CH Heavy Commercial. Again, I'll call forward city planner Chris Kelly. Let me try something real quick. Nah. All right. This property is located in the southwestern quadrant of the city limits or the city. More specifically, this property is located along the southern right of way of Southwest Greenville Boulevard and 520 feet west of Front Gate Drive. This is an image of the pro uh, a photo taken of the property off of Southwest Greenville Boulevard. Uh, to the left will be Front Gate Drive. This is a survey of the entire property. I've outlined the portion of the property in red for you tonight, 0 0.43 acres. This property is located in the Greens Mill Run watershed, and if stormwater rules apply, it will require 25-year detention and nitrogen and phosphorus reduction will be required. The property is not located in the special flood hazard area, and no jurisdictional wetlands, streams, and riparian buffers exist on the property. <clears throat> Due to staff not anticipating a change in intensity between the 
the current and requested zoning district, a traffic volume report was not generated. The request tonight is currently zoned OR and the remainder of the property being CH, uh, zone CH. The request intends to make the entire property one zoning district, which would be CH or heavy commercial. The future land use map, uh, the future land use and character map recommends commercial at the southeastern corner of Front Gate Drive and Southwest Greenville Boulevard. Um, this transitions into office and institutional to the west. The requested zoning is commercial. Um, again, the intent of the rezoning is to make the property one zoning district instead of being split zoned. In staff's opinion, the requested zoning is in compliance with the horizons and the future land use plan. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the request. And on October 17, 2023, the Planning and Zoning Commission unanimously uh, voted to approve the request. I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. Any questions for Mr. Kelly? Shock. Council Member Blackburn. Shock. I have questions. Can you put the map back up that showed the surrounding zoning, if you wouldn't mind, please? So that's the surrounding zoning. And then um, my, my question is just uh, how is it that this ended up being, you know, office and the rest of it is CH? Is this, is this now the predominant? I mean, clearly I see all the red, but is this just the predominant use now? Is this a more consistent, I guess, with, with the way this area is developing? Uh, in, yes, ma'am, with how our uh, future land use map how we thought about it when this uh, plan was made, uh, it recommends commercial. So yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Kelly? All right. Thank you very much. The public hearing is now open. Those who speak on behalf of the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Hey, good evening. Uh, good evening. My name's Connor Linton. I work for Kimley Horn, civil engineer for this project. Uh, I don't have anything else to add, but happy to answer any questions council may have. All right. Any questions? I think we're good. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to speak on behalf of the applicant? You may come forward. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. See none. Those in opposition to the applicant may come forward. Please state your name for the record. The first person has 10 minutes. All others have three minutes. Seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. Open for a board discussion or a motion. Motion, motion approved. Second. All right, motion was made by Councilmember Robinson, second by Councilmember Blackburn. All those in favor say aye. 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 As opposed, say nay. Motion passes 6 0. We will leapfrog over 11, close out the public hearings, and move on to other items of business. Item number 12, Mr. Manager. Mayor, item number 12 is the first reading of ordinances requested by the Neighborhood and Business Services and Planning and Development Services Departments to repeal and replace as amended. Title IX, Chapter 1, Inspections and Code Enforcement, and Title 12, Chapter 3, Weeds, Vegetation, and Other Public Nuisances. Now call forward the Code Enforcement Officer, Mr. William Lowry. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, so this is going to be the first reading of the uh, various updates for Title IX, Chapter 1, and Title 12, Chapter 3 of the City Code. Uh, the project overview of the city code updates is to update the city code to align with North Carolina general statutes. Uh, city code related to code enforcement, inspections, and public nuisances have not been updated in many years. The general purpose is to clean up ordinances, update procedures and processes, define and redefine terms to provide clarity, update placement of language to provide consistency in various activities, and then just to create a greater efficiency and consistent implementation of policies and procedures. The project overview continued is to focus on two titles, Title IX, Chapter 1, which encompasses inspections and code enforcement, and then Title 12, Chapter 3, weeds, vegetation, and other public health nuisances. 
These are examples of the Title IX Chapter 1 update. And just to clarify, this is to align it with the current NC general statutes and North Carolina technical terms. Um, an example of Section 9160 changes in work is to update it to the general statute language. Underlined is to include those uh, verbiage. The Title IX, Section 9192 definitions is to update the uh, designation of code enforcement coordinator. It'll now say code enforcement supervisor. That's been the job description title for some years now. And then the very bottom is the update to minimum standards. And this is to align with the current technical codes. We're not creating any new standards. Uh, so an example is for the plumbing system, a water closet commonly known as a toilet. Uh, we're including the flushing mechanisms in this as well. Um, Article A, adoption of regulated code by reference. We're merging all state codes adopted by this body into one section, technical codes. The current code has them all separated in separate sections. And then Article B, inspections division, Article F, minimum housing, and G, non-residential building and structure. And we added the general statute language for administrative liability and conflicts of interest to those sections. Uh, to align with the ordinance adopted in June 8th of 2023, ordinance number 23048, uh, we're updating the penalties to align with that ordinance up, um, approval. Those articles are Article C, enforcement, F, minimum housing, G, non-residential building and structure, and Article H, regulations on vacated and closed buildings or structures and dwellings. Uh, as shown at the bottom, the first violation is $100. The second violation within the same year as the first is 250 and then third and in subsequent violations when that same year is $500. Uh, for Article F, minimum housing code, the process for abandoned structure, which was previously Article E, has emerged into Article F, minimum housing. And then again, various technical updates to NC state codes. Um, these are just examples where, for example, the porches and raised platforms minimum standard, our current code says 40 inches above ground requires railing the current state code is 30 inches. Um, for minimum standards and smoke detectors, we've updated that language to align with state building code and then added the language for carbon monoxide detectors. And then again, added general statute language for administrative liability and conflict of interest. Uh, under responsibilities for pest elimination, we've updated that to now specify property owners are solely responsible for pest elimination with the exception is when the code enforcement officer determines the occupant is the cause of that uh, uh, pest. Under Article H, regulations on vacated closed buildings and structures and dwellings, we've developed definition and enforcement procedures. The inclusion of a notice period for property owners to secure or re-secure their properties before enforcement action, and then failure to remediate could result in civil penalties or abatement by the division. An example of abatement is the city coming in and re-securing that property. Moving on to Title 12, Chapter 3, these are just some examples of some updates that we're doing uh, for Section 1233E. Um, that's just, it says, general open collection of stagnant water and insects to tend to breed. We had two other sections that mirrored that to encompass some stuff, so we merged that all together under one section. Article G, any concentration of building material and uh, open, open storage of building material, we've added that to a new section with uh, firewood and other similar materials need to be elevated at least six inches off the ground. And then our Article C, graffiti, we've uh, updated that definition to be more clear and precise um, to take away the aspect and be a little more clear on what the type is. Moving on to vegetation, we created an allowance for properties greater than one acre. This will allow for a cut depth of 20 feet from the improved road surface. Um, but, however, if the property abuts an adjoining property with buildings or structures, residential or commercial, it will require a 100-foot cutback. We created a definition section for Article A nuisances, which allows a clear definition for the type of nuisances enforced by the division. The addition of language for enforcement of items uses tables and front yards of properties, and then length of time in which a property owner is determined to be a chronic violator under the public nuisance ordinance. Moving on, updated appeals process to allow more internal review. Uh, property owners will have 10 days to submit an appeals request in writing to the code enforcement supervisor. Appeals of that decision will move to the director of neighborhood and business services or their designee within five days. And then appeals of the director's decision would go to the board of adjustment and that will follow general statute guidelines. 
And then Article C graffiti, uh, the entire article was updated to allow efficient, consistent enforcement of processes, and we work closely with the police department to update that article. And then again, as stated in Title IX, we update our penalties to align with the ordinance that was approved by the body on June 8, 2023. The articles updated were Article A, nuisances, and Article C graffiti, and the uh, violation proceeding follows the same aspect as it did in Title IX. Uh, next step, uh, staff recommends initial approval of recommended updates. City Council will vote on adoption in December after public hearing. And then I am free to answer any questions. All right, any questions? Council Member Daniels. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good, thank you for that presentation. Can you go back to the fees? So after the third um, violation, do we take them to court and, and include fees, court fees and things like that? Or how does that work? No, ma'am. Uh, if it's um, each subsequent violation will be just $500 after that until they bring the property into compliance. Oh, 500 on to 500? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. um, but if the property, if the violation is abatable, then the city will proceed to just abate the nuisance and remediate the issue that, um, that way. Great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Any other questions? That's all we need, right? Yeah. Mayor and Council insist this uh, ordinance includes criminal sanctions. State law requires two readings, and it takes out, so you have a reading when you conduct the vote. So I would uh, encourage Council to take an initial vote tonight, and then at the, in de at the December meeting, you'll take the final vote. So we won't, not all of us, right? Well, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Some of the unlucky. So, all right, so we need to take a vote. Before we vote, if you don't mind, I just have a few words of encouragement comment about these uh, it, this is not uh, casting any aspersion at the work that our staff did when we discussed this in our workshop uh, I encouraged my peers on council to look at ways we could have a more flexible system that would allow for instance the development of urban meadows um, I'm concerned when we use uh, words like nuisance that would apply to, for instance, native grasses, um, dandelions, chickweed. These are items that are commonly referred to as weeds, but in fact they're native to our area. And um, many of them are critical pollinators. I think that um, you don't have to go far to see news about um, honeybee hive collapse and the death of pollinators uh, throughout our nation that are related to um, among other things, excessive use of fertilizers, excessive use of pesticides. And when we have a single species grass, for instance, you've got acres of centipede or acres of Bermuda or whatever you grow, there is not ecological diversity there and it makes it very difficult to maintain the uh, insect species that are so critical without which we human beings will not continue. And so one of the things I hope we'll do moving forward is take another look at our codes where um, growth is involved in, and to craft them in a more flexible way that would allow the creation of urban meadows. Again, this is not an excuse just to let your yard go, not at all. This is a way where we as a city could allow people to intentionally and with um, guidelines have yards that are not limited to um, two inches of centipede that's cut regularly. They, they would have to be groomed, but it would be more of a garden approach. Um, again, just to go back to the reasons why that's important. Lawns are um, beautiful, but they are also sources of toxic pesticides and nitrous fertilizer runoff. This runs into our waterways, and we've seen what happens when we have um, over um, sort of outsourcing of nitrous fertilizers. It kills our waterways. And then the last thing I'll end with is our pollinators really depend on um, plants like dandelions, which I know a lot of uh, homeowners really dislike dandelions. Dandelions are one of the first blooms to appear in the spring and pollinators like bees have nothing else to eat and they depend on flowers like 
dandelions um, to survive. And I've seen them actually dying and tried to, you know, I, I, my, my story is I had one that was dying in my yard until I took him to a patch of dandelions. And, and just to, to, to make ourselves again, if we want to put human activity at the center, we will not survive without pollinators. So the last thing I'll say is that um, I often hear people sort of decrying or moaning or nostalgic about lightning bugs, and they say, I just, we just don't have lightning bugs anymore. Lightning bugs spend their formative time in tall grass, and that's where they develop enough to be able to uh, fly around and provide that sort of special nighttime sparkle that we all care about so much. So there are real repercussions when we don't allow grasses to grow, when we don't allow native pollinators to grow. And again, I hope that in the future we can revisit these ordinances and provide some flexibility for urban meadows and other forms of vegetation in our yards. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Do we have a motion to approve or deny? We have to. He's, he wanted us to to do a uh, initial vote, first vote. All right. Motion's been made by Councilmember Robinson, second by Councilmember Bell. All those in favor, say aye. 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 As opposed, say nay. Motion passes six zero. Thank, Thank you very much. All right. Let's move on to lucky number thirteen, Mr. Manager. Mayor, item number thirteen is budget ordinance amendment number four to the 2023-24. City of Greenville budget ordinance 23-46, capital projects fund ordinance 17-24, donations fund ordinance number 18-62, and special revenue grants fund ordinance 11-3. I will call forward Director of Financial Services Byron Hayes for the quick presentation. Yep. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is budget amendment number four. Um, Budget Amendment 4 includes adjustments to the General Fund, the Housing Fund, the Rec and Parks Capital Projects Fund, the Grant Special Revenue Fund, and the Donations Fund. Um, breaking down the amendments, we are recognizing grant funding received from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security um, in addition to a general fund match for the assistance to firefighters grant. Uh, it's an increase to the Grant Special Revenue Fund of just under $300,000. Um, reallocating funding from the General Fund to the Housing Fund for funded positions within uh, the Neighborhood and Business Services Department, a neutral um, impact to the general fund of $54,000. Uh, we are reallocating funds within the Facilities Improvement Program to the Rec and Parks Capital Project Fund for gas smith improvements. Um, a portion of that project is funded uh, through donations, and that is an increase to the Rec and Parks Capital Project Fund of just over $500,000. Um, we are recognizing recreation park donations that have been received in the current fiscal year, increased to the donations fund of $77,000. Uh, we're also recognizing funding received from the North Carolina Tri-Party Grant for the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency Construction Training Program, <coughs> increase in the housing fund of $70,000. Uh, additionally, we are adjusting transfers to reflect projected actuals through the first quarter of fiscal year 24, uh, an increase to the general fund of uh, a little bit over a million dollars. Um, we're also transferring additional funding from the general fund uh, for the Greenfield Terrace project, an increase um, of just under $500,000. Uh, we are recognizing partnership funding for the Shot Spotter program, an increase of $240,000. And finally, we are appropriating federal forfeiture funds uh, for equipment and software for the police department, uh, as presented earlier uh, at the uh, November 9th council meeting increase in the general fund of $171,000. Um, so as a result of the amendments, this increases the city's operating fund budget to $175.7 million, and staff recommends approval of the operating fund ordinance, the capital projects fund ordinance, the donations fund ordinance, and the special revenue fund ordinance. Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Hayes? Nothing? No questions? Nothing. Move to approve the item. Second. Second. All right. Motion's been made by Councilmember Smiley, second by Councilmember Blackburn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion passes 6 0. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this is the last meeting for Mr. Hayes. 
And we would like to say, I personally, I would personally like to say thank you for all that you've done for the city of Greenville. You've done an incredible job in the financial services department. Um, I have been an elected official now for eight years, and I could say that when I got in, it wasn't so great. And what you guys are doing right now and what you've been able to lead that department to do is incredible. Um, I just, just the other week, I think I received a, a notification that you guys won another award for excellent um, reporting. And so thank you for all that you've done. We wish you well wishes as you move forward. Please, please, please come back to Greenville. <laughs> we, we would love to have you back. But thank you for all that you've done. We really appreciate your service to the city. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, it's been an honor uh, to serve in the financial services director role uh, for this council in the city. Um, I've enjoyed my time very, very much with the city. I definitely appreciate it. I'm not going to say much more, but thank you guys. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. And no pressure now. The first ever city manager's report by Mr. Cowan. Uh, you kind of stole my thunder there, man, because <laughs> I, I was going to, uh, to give a shout out to Byron myself. Uh, I, I would say that I, I'm in my ninth year here with the city, and Byron and I uh, kind of came on at the same time, and, and it was some tough times. It really was uh, with the situation that, uh, that we came into, and, and it has just been a pleasure to work with him and beside him as we have made a lot of progress. And, leaving the, the city in very strong financial position and uh, I just thank him for, for everything that he's done. I, it's like I'm, I'm losing a kid. It really is. I feel like my, my child is leaving but I, I do wish him the best um, in his role moving, moving forward. And that's all I have. Alright. We'll go on to the comments from the mayor and the city council. Who wants to start tonight? Council member Robinson? Jump on me first. Yeah. First, uh, we got a basketball game on Saturday at ECU. They had their first game and, and swamped the other team. Came back on them looking good. Uh, I think if you look online, it looks like it's starting at 4, but it's actually starting at 2 o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. They're playing the Campbell Campbells, my alma mater for law school. So um, congratulations to them. Congratulations to our city manager for his first full meeting. Congratulations. We look forward to working with you. And uh, I'm excited about your position, and, and look, I personally look forward to working with you in the next two years. And so thank you so much for that. Uh, tomorrow we are closed for Veterans Day, and so uh, Veterans Day is actually celebrated on Saturday, on uh, the 11th. But if you see a veteran, take the time out to say to him or her thank you for your service, because it is a big deal whether they went overseas or not. This being a veteran is a big deal for our freedoms here in this country. So if you see somebody on the street in a line, buy them a cup of coffee, buy them a donut, buy them their lunch or anything as a small token to say thank you for what you've done for our country. So again, uh, we're closed Friday, but it's celebrated on actually Friday and Saturday. So take the time out and say thank you to a veteran. Thank you, Mayor. That's all my comments. Thank you very much. Councilmember Bell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would like to first start by just thanking everybody on this dais for, for stepping up and running for office. For those of us that won, or for those of you that did win, congratulations. Um, and I would also like to you know, say thank you to the candidates that ran uh, and did not win. Uh, we're all putting ourselves out there and uh, opening ourselves up to uh, you know, a lot of different, different things. So um, you know, appreciate their willingness to serve. Congratulation, uh, congratulations to the winner of the at-large race, Portia Willis. She worked really hard and ran a really strong campaign. So congratulations to her. I'm looking forward to seeing the positive change that she brings to this council. Um, and then I do want to touch on um, there were things written in the paper this last week, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into the weeds on it at all, but I do want to uh, remind the reflector specifically that it is extremely important that when you report the news that you know for a fact that it is factual. You should not rush a story out for whatever purpose that is done, but you should verify facts before because you lose a ton of credibility when you don't do that. Some information will be coming out on that soon, and that's all I got. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Council Member Smiley. I have no comments. Wow. Come on. Something. Say something. Say something. Like, you love your mom? You love your wife? <laughs> something. Why are you asking Deuces. me, Mayor? You're putting me on the spot here, you know? Deuces. Deuces. We got one more meeting. Okay. All right. All right. No pressure. No pressure. Councilmember Blackbird. 
Uh, yes, I, I just uh, would also like to uh, thank the community for coming out to vote. It was about, it was a little more than a 14% turnout. Local election turnout is typically not very high, but to those 14%, thank you so much for turning out and voting. Uh, local election, elections are very important because we make the decisions that really affect people every single day of their life. I also would like to thank specifically the voters of District 3 for returning me to office. This is work that is very meaningful to me. It's work that I absolutely adore. It's also work that's a great privilege and an honor and work that I take very seriously. Uh, every two years on this council, we go back to the voters. And we talk with them individually. We talk with them in groups. We do questionnaires. We put it all out there for to be reviewed and to be analyzed and to be criticized. And um, I think that anyone who runs for office has show, does show a lot of courage. And to my peers who ran this time, I feel that I was amongst a very good group of people, an excellent group of people who, uh, for the most part, did their homework and presented their ideas in a respectful way. And um, it was, it was a, a very vigorous election season. And again, thank you to the voters of District 3 for returning me to office. And you know how to get in touch with me, and I'm sure that you will, about your concerns. I would also like to just briefly mention, um, I've seen a whole lot of news coverage about the Gervais, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, the whale that washed up alive in it, in, on Emerald Isle, on the beach at Emerald Isle, and this whale was alive. And let's not forget that whales are very, very intelligent. Um, they're no doubt uh, uh, very high reasoning, very high emotional level. And this whale washed up alive on Emerald Isle shore and has since, has of course, died. And the reason that this whale died was because the whale ingested a mylar balloon. The whale ate a mylar balloon. And this gets back to the proposal that I made that I understand seemed very perhaps strange to a lot of people. They couldn't understand what's the harm in releasing balloons. And I am appreciative of my colleagues, Council Members Daniel and Smiley, who supported that initiative. I think what we see when we see a whale wash up, we understand that the mass balloon releases, sure, they're litter, but they're a particularly insidious kind of litter because once they get in waterways, they look just like food to marine animals. And moreover, they have consequences for us as human beings. And I just would like to say that I'm glad we have begun the community conversation about those mass helium balloon releases and you don't have to look far to see the harmful consequences that they have for our environment and that's my comments thank you thank you very much council member Daniels thank you mayor um, I also would like to wish everyone um, <clears throat> excuse me not everybody but a happy veterans day to our veterans and to thank you for our service there will be a program, um, excuse me, to honor our veterans at the Town Common this Saturday at 11 o'clock a.m. I would also like to thank the voters of District 1 for voting me back in. Thank you to um, Ms. Arjanae Jones um, for her desire to run, and I know that we will continue to work together in our community. Um, there will be a small business assistance grant program on November the 14th. Um, if you'd like to apply for any of our small business grants, the process will be explained, um, the grant process and all that good stuff. So please show up for that. Um, there's more information on our website. Um, there will also be a shred event on the 18th, I believe it is, on the 18th at our public works department. So bring all your shred shredder items out for that. And I would like to um, congratulate Mr. Ivory Mewborn in the town of Aden as he was elected the first African-American mayor of Aden. Thank you. Uh -oh, this is be long. Mayor Pro Tem Glover. I'd like to thank um, everyone that um, came out to vote and uh, exercise your right to vote because it's not a, it's not a right that we take um, lightly because we know for, we have to go through the to vote. So um, if you don't vote, please get out and vote at the next election, whenever there's an election. Um, um, secondly, um, 
I just want to thank um, my husband for um, putting up with this for 23 years and um, and putting up with me being going in and out all the time after we retired. We retired when I went on. Oops, my back's off. We retired when I went on uh, the city council. So, um, um, and I've been on the city council ever since I retired. So I'm gonna go to retirement now. And I'm gonna en enjoy life and enjoy the people all around me. My sister's coming home from Connecticut and she's excited and we're excited for them to come. And so we're just gonna um, be happy be together and love each other and the staff. I know I gotta speak again, don't I, at the next meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll cut some of it off then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cut some of it off this time. I'll put through the rest at the next meeting. Thank you, Mayor. All right. I'd like to wish everyone, all of our veterans, a happy Veterans Day this weekend. I know we're observing it tomorrow, but actual Veterans Day is on the 11th month the 11th day, the 11th hour we celebrate. So thank you to all of our veterans. We would not all be here today living in this incredible country that we are without your service to our country. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I encourage you also to get out to the town commons for the uh, event that's gonna take place this weekend. I uh, also wanna say thank you to all the voters that went out there to vote this uh, election cycle. Uh, we appreciate your participation. Continue to urge others to continue to vote. It's very important to come out here uh, and participate in the process. Congratulations to everyone that won, and congratulations uh, to all my colleagues that have served up here for two years. And uh, we'll be moving on to other things. Uh, you know, we become a family. I think all of us can agree that uh, we all have our differences and we all think differently. But you know, we grow together. And over the last two years or two years plus, we've all grown with one another and became a big family. You know, we can sit here and we can have conversations with one another. We don't agree with each other all the time, uh, but we're all coming from a different place and we all bring our, our perspectives together to make a good collective decision for what's best for our city. So I've always enjoyed working with everybody. I look forward to coming to these meetings and, and going to different events with you guys. You guys are incredible. The citizens of Greenville are very lucky to have you as leaders of the city. And I look forward to those that uh, were elected um, by the citizens that have not served and were elected this term. I look forward to working with you uh, over the next two years. We'll have a lot of things that we can work on as a, a city together. A lot of great things are happening in our city. And there's a lot of great things that are going to continue to happen in our city, but uh, we all got to work together. So I'm looking forward to it, and I hope that everybody has a good weekend. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Attorney McGirt for the motion to go into closed session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council Members, I recommend that Council adopt the following motion holding a closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11 for the following reasons, to, to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body, to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney, including for the purpose of the public body, considering and give instructions to an attorney concerning the handling or settlement of a claim or judicial action. Second, to discuss matters relating to the location or expansion of industries or other businesses in the area served by the public body, including agreement on a tentative list of economic development incentives that may be offered by the public body in negotiations. Move to adopt that motion. Second. Motion has been made by Council Member Robinson, second by Council Member Blackburn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 6-0. We are officially in closed session. Jesus. <laughs>